Welcome to the Positive Productivity Podcast, episode number 84. Welcome to Positive Productivity Podcast, where we empower our audience to achieve and appreciate personal and professional success, especially in the face of adversity. Listen in as our guests reveal their stories of challenges and hurdles and how they overcame defeat and became triumphant in their endeavors. Let's get motivated and move forward with your host, Kim Sutton. Welcome back to another episode of Positive Productivity. This is your host, Kim Sutton, and today I am thrilled to have an awesome guest, Brogan Mikuloff. I got that right, right? Yes, you did. Awesome. <laughs> Who is a content strategist with BroganMikuloff.com. Welcome, Brogan. I'm so happy you're here. Thanks, Kim. I'm so excited to be here too. Brogan helps determined, heart-centered, and creative entrepreneurs get their message out of their head and to their people. That is so fabulous. I've never heard it said that way, but I absolutely love it. Can you share about your journey, how you got to where you are today and yeah, like what you're doing? Yeah, sure. So I suppose my kind of entrepreneurial journey only really started maybe two or three years ago. I definitely wasn't one of those kids who was like, you know, selling cookies by the side of the road or, or anything like that. My entrepreneurial spirit started much later on. And so I've been working in kind of content strategy and communication, online marketing, basically since I graduated from uni. So it's four or five years now. And I got to the stage where in my job, it was basically my role to to start our our communication strategy for you know online basically from scratch <laughs> so i was fresh out of uni had no idea what i was doing and i somehow stumbled upon marie folio and her b school program and i wanted to upskill didn't want to go back and do another you know marketing uni degree so I decided to learn from an entrepreneur who, you know, was at basically at the front of their game, right? Because entrepreneurs have to understand online marketing, especially if you've got an online business. So I decided that that was the best place to learn from. I think I got to about module two and decided, you know what, like stuff learning this for my job. I'm going to start my own business. <laughs> I kind of spent the next couple of years trying to work out what I wanted to do ended up working with a business coach right from the start who kind of showed me that, you know, hey, you do really love communication and this is definitely what you're supposed to do. And so everything kind of just went from there. And having someone to kind of build my business with was for me definitely the best decision, especially because, you know, kind of making that transition from the kind of corporate world and all of the you know, the mindset stuff that goes on with creating a business, which beforehand I never knew existed. It's not something that ever came up in my, my corporate job. So having someone there to support me through that process was absolutely amazing. And the really good thing about it now is that I still get to do the work that I absolutely love. I still get to work on communication and content strategy. But I, now I get to choose who I work with and I get to work with amazing women from all over the world who have incredible businesses, but who really kind of struggle with, like you said in the intro, with, you know, getting their message out of their head and to those who really need it most. And for me, that's the really important part. It's I strongly believe that everyone has a message to share and that everyone can help somebody else. And so my job is really to help them kind of facilitate that process and to help them help those who they were kind of called to help. Oh, I love every bit of that. How many of your clients would you say come to you without clearly knowing who their ideal client is? And do you help them with that? Yeah. So it's, Probably about 50-50. I think there's been, especially more recently, there's been a lot kind of more talk about, you know, being really super clear on who your ideal client is. So some people come to me and they're already very clear on who they're targeting and who their ideal client is. And others are kind of just like, I help women, <laughs> which as we know is definitely not specific enough. So yeah, that is definitely a part of, of what I do is, you know, if you're not clear on who you're targeting, we kind of work through 
some, you know, different questions and, and I help them kind of really clarify that and figure out exactly who they are targeting. And the other kind of important element within that kind of whole conversation is I've found that with, when some people have done this kind of like ideal customer avatar or, you know, dream client, whatever you want to call it, that kind of work, oftentimes there's a really big focus on what those women or people, whoever your ideal client is, what they kind of struggle with just in terms of their business, you know, what's kind of going on in their business what challenges they face. And a lot of people are kind of forgetting to add those other kind of lifestyle elements that round out their ideal client into a real person. So for example, they, you know, might not think about the TV shows they watch or the websites that they love looking at or the different entrepreneurs that they follow or the fact that they've just got married or they've just had a baby or, you know, their kids have, are often, you know, kind of playing up or whatever and they're in this really hard transition in life. And the reason that it's really important to include that stuff in part of your ideal client work is that, like I said, like it helps to round out your ideal client into a real person because, as humans, like we're not just all about business and there are so many other facets to our life, to our personality. And that kind of content and that kind of information is what is going to really help you add personality to your content and to really create content that connects with people because that's where you're going to get the emotional ties from. And that's where you're really going to either write something or film a video or create a podcast episode that, you know, your ideal client reads or hears and makes them say like, wow, this is the person for me. This is the person I have to work with. How is she or he like in my head? How do they know exactly what I'm struggling with? So I have to ask you, does your ideal client have a name? I often kind of change the name of my ideal client. I don't know why. It kind of sounds a bit silly, but it's like I can never quite settle on (laughs) exactly what her name is. So for me, I have a, a kind of specific person in mind, but I haven't actually given her a name. And I think, you know, you can do it either way if it really, if that feels right for you and if that helps you when it comes to writing content for your business or it comes to creating products and services, if it really helps to have a name in mind, then you can totally do that. The other way that you can do it as well is while I have, you know, so I've got my ideal client profile. Often I try and think about people who are already in my community that match that ideal profile really closely And when it comes to thinking about a new product or service or thinking about a particular blog post that I want to write, I try and keep that particular person in mind. And I find that for me, that really works in keeping an actual like real person in mind, because that's the other important factor with your ideal client profile is that you have to back it up with like real data. It can't just be someone who you've kind of imagined out of nothing (laughs) because often what can happen then is you're, you end up creating problems that, that don't actually exist or that people aren't actually struggling with. And as we know, like people have enough problems as it is, they don't need us to create more for them. So they don't. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So it is really important that whether, you know, you are just keeping an actual real person in mind who is your ideal client or whether you're creating your, you know, your fictional, if you like, ideal customer avatar, you need to include the real data. And so, you know, that's surveying your audience. It's paying attention when you are talking to people on discovery calls or sales calls. If you, if your business is structured that way, you know, it's, it's just paying attention to what people actually say. And that will give you the information that you need to add that real data into your ideal customer avatar. And that is what is really going to make it powerful. I am guilty of only having gotten so far as speakers, authors, and coaches. So I know that I have work to do, 
but making that transition because when I started my business in 2012, I was one of those, oh, everyone, <laughs> people, you know, who do you want to work for? Oh, any entrepreneur. Well, I clearly, <laughs> I, I learned over the last four years that that couldn't be further from the truth. And I love how you say heart centered because I am all about that myself. Like I love helping coaches, speakers, and authors spread their messages and their programs and their products to the people who need to see them. And I think that that is very much similar to what you are trying to do as well. The reason why I asked if yours had a name was because it intrigues me greatly that John Lee Dumas has actually named his perfect listener, Jimmy. And he has, he's even gone so far as to have a video on his about page. I'll put a a link to it in the show notes for anybody who's interested in watching it. But he has a whole video that he's created about Jimmy. I don't know that it's necessary to go that far, but it's definitely interesting how in depth he's gone. Yeah, that is, that is really cool. I'd actually love to see that video. But yeah, I think again, like it depends on on what you need to do in order to really clarify who that person is. And the other good thing about either, you know, creating a video like that and putting it on your website, or I've seen other entrepreneurs write a blog post that's all about exactly who they serve and who they can help the most. And the good thing about kind of putting it out there kind of publicly, if you like, is that when your ideal client reads that, And they go, you know, and they see that it's, you know, such and such a person who runs this type of business and is really into like running and green smoothies or whatever. They read that and they go, that's me. Like that is totally me. This person is exactly who I'm looking for and who I, who I want to work with. Like this must be the perfect person for me because like it's spelled out. Like I can see myself in this profile And so it can be really powerful to help draw the right people to you and at the same time repel those that you are not meant to serve. And, you know, it's interesting that you talked about, you know, right at the start, you you know, you just wanted to help everyone. And I think honestly, most of us are at that stage when we first start our business because we kind of feel like, oh, no, we don't want anyone to miss out. Like, you know, we want to help everyone and we know that we can help everyone in that sense. But the whole kind of point of, of doing that ideal customer avatar activity and realizing that there is a core group of people who you can really, really help and who are ready for you to help. And that's the important aspect. Those people are the ones who are like ready to take action and who you can really help to achieve whatever it is that you are trying to help them with through your business. And, you know, trying to being able to help everyone is, is really not, is not a reality. And, you know, there's enough people out there in the world and we can access them through the internet, that having a really small niche or boutique business can totally work because you have the potential to be able to reach so many more people now than if you, you know, had started the same business in your local community, for example. Oh, absolutely. So I would love to hear your interpretation of heart-centered entrepreneurs. I know you say heart-centered and creative entrepreneurs, but when you are serving heart-centered, what are you looking for? That's my questions expand themselves when they're coming out of my mouth, so forgive me, but there's a part two. What happens if somebody who you don't consider to be heart-centered and creative comes your way and wants to hire you? Do you have a practice for that? I think it's just being, you know, open and honest both with yourself and with them. Because I think what I've found is that knowing that I can best help somebody who is heart-centered and who is creative, and I I will come back and I'll define what I mean by heart-centered in a minute, knowing that those are the people who I can really get results for and who I can really help, you know, them deal with their overwhelm or their stress or their frustration or whatever they're feeling in terms of their content, whether that's for their blog or social media, I know that I can really help them get results. 
And I know that they're often in a space where they're more ready to take action. They're more ready to commit. They're, they're more ready to just jump on this and go, yep, like this is what I really need right now. This is a priority for me right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and yep, let's do this. Whereas if someone comes to me and they don't necessarily fit that bill, generally speaking, they're not in the place where they're ready for me to help them. And again, that's it's just about being open and honest with them because for me, you know, I consider myself to be a heart-centered business owner as well. And for me, that just doesn't feel right. If I know that I can't really help you and if I know that I can't help you get the results that you're looking for and if I know that I'm not the best person to help you through this next stage in your journey it doesn't feel right to me to take your money in that sense or to to work with you and so if that ever happens if I've got somebody else in mind who I think would be a better fit for them then you know I pass on their contact details or if I have, if I know of other resources that I think would be helpful for them, then I always just, you know, pass that on and explain as well why I think that we're not going to be a good fit. And then in terms of kind of what I consider heart-centered to be, I think it's really the person who is really committed to helping people. And at the core of their being, that is what really drives them. They are generous and they are giving and to them what makes them feel amazing when they wake up each morning is knowing that they have the opportunity to really help somebody else and whether that is for free through the resources, the free resources that they put out or whether that's through the clients or the customers that they work with through their business. I think it's just a whole attitude of of how you look at business and how you look at the interaction between, you know, you as the business owner and your client and customer. And I think it's really looking at that as an actual relationship and not just as a transaction And the fact that, you know, you want to kind of get to know your customer or your client as a person, and it's not merely just an exchange of money for a service or a product. I absolutely love all of that. And when I was starting out, it was honestly everyone because I was afraid that it wasn't going to succeed. So I was open to accepting payment from anybody who was willing to hire me and that it changed. It took a a few years to change, but when it did, it sort of slapped me in the face. I was like, hello, you know, (laughs) it, you can be so much more enthusiastic about what you're doing for other people when you totally embrace what they're doing. And although nobody else's success is ever going to be your 100% priority, like your own successes, mm-hmm. it's a lot easier to feel 99% yes. engaged because when you're not, like, when you're only 1% vested in whether or not they succeed, it's so easy to shove it to the bottom of the pile repeatedly. And that's where those negative feedbacks come from. And you don't want that. It just no, doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's not a it's not a good place to kind of run your business from because it will completely drain you, especially if you do consider yourself to be someone who is more of a kind of heart-centered or a creative or, you know, that kind of type of entrepreneur. It will drain you and it will it will kind of have its effect. I think kind of, you know, the interesting point with the whole kind of ideal customer avatar or dream client conversation is that it is something that does take time and starting from a place, you know, at the start of your business or wherever you are right now, like even if you think you're still in that kind of phase of, Oh, I want to help everyone. I think it's still a useful phase to be in because, you know, like you said, it does help you clarify exactly who you want to work with. And it does show you, okay, this kind of person, when I work with them, I feel really drained. 
I don't really feel good. I'm not invested in their in their success. But when I work with this other kind of person, it's completely different. I feel uplifted. I feel incredible. And I feel very invested in their success. So I think if you are kind of in that phase now where you're maybe afraid to kind of narrow down your focus of who you serve, use that as an opportunity to really work out who you love to work with and then gradually over time like find more of those people and you'll find that you will you know kind of eventually organically discover who your kind of dream client is and so I think that that whole process is incredibly useful. I found that draining could even follow me into Facebook because when I was focused on everybody and anybody I was a member of no joke, probably 180 different Facebook groups, <laughs> right? So as yes. I got more clear, I started getting out of the Facebook groups that weren't in mm-hmm. line with what I was doing. And over time, I also realized that Facebook groups may not be the best place for finding my clients and LinkedIn really became more key and a bigger part of where I was doing my search because they were, they were the clients who really were looking for me. And there's, there's so many great groups over there, which leads me to wanting to ask about where you see some of the mistakes or mishaps, or maybe just oversights happening when people are looking at their blog, at their email newsletters and at social media. Are there any big points that you see people just overlooking when they're looking when they are looking at their overall strategy? Yes. So the biggest one is getting caught up in hashtag all the things and trying to do everything all at once. And I see so many, especially like solopreneurs or you may have maybe a VA or a very small team, but I see so many entrepreneurs you know, kind of get caught up in the next best thing and kind of bounce between, especially on social media, bounce between kind of like each of the social networks and kind of try and be always about following the trends. And like you said before, you know, where you found out that, okay, maybe my ideal client's actually more likely to be on LinkedIn rather than in Facebook groups. Like that's a really powerful and important realization. And I think, we all need to kind of at regular intervals, like step back and take that bird's eye view and go, okay, do I really need to be on Twitter or do I really need to be on face in a Facebook group or do I really need to be on Instagram? And I think often we're afraid <laughs> to say, you know what, I don't really need to be here because it's not – helping me, you know, build my new like and trust factor, reach more of my ideal clients, get more people on my list and eventually lead to more sales. And I think we can get caught up in trying to use social media for business like we do or did on our personal profiles. And they are very different. Your business profiles are Yes, about building that connection with people, about building that relationship with people. But at the same time, if it's not helping you achieve your business goals, then why are you there? And maybe it's a matter of looking at, okay, am I using it strategically? Am I actually putting out content that is helping to build my know, like, and trust factor that's telling people about my business, about, you know, sharing the different products and services that I offer, showing people how I can help them? Or are you using it a bit more kind of ad hoc or do you just not need to be there? And so I think that's a really important thing to, you know, take that time to kind of step back and analyze that. And the same thing kind of goes with your blog. So when I talk about blogs, I kind of think about it as your kind of core piece of communication. So your blog can either be, you know, kind of like the traditional written blog or it can be, you know, a video blog or even 
it can include a podcast. So it's thinking about it in terms of, okay, this is my kind of main piece of content that I'm putting out. And it's always a good idea to have it hosted on your own site because that's where you're driving traffic to. You're you're driving traffic to you rather than trying to push them over to, you know, your Facebook page, which you don't own. So I think, again, taking that step back, looking at your blog and saying, okay, what kind of content do I actually really enjoy creating? And kind of not ignoring, but taking kind of expert advice in that sense with a grain of salt. Because yes, writing kind of long form blog posts is really great for SEO, is can be really great for kind of building your your expertise. But at the same time, if you absolutely hate writing and it completely drains you to write an a thousand or a two thousand word blog post then people are going to feel that because I really believe that the energy that you bring to your content, whether that's written, whether it's filmed or it's an audio, people are really going to feel that. And if you are creating from a place of, I really don't want to do this. It just feels icky. I hate doing this. Then people are going to feel that. So take a look at, okay, what kind of content do I like creating? Maybe you don't like writing, but maybe video is something that you really enjoy and that comes across really well for you and that your community really enjoys. So then use that aspect of it and use that as your blog. So I think the kind of main point of all of this is, yes, like keep on top of the trends and keep reading what, you know, some of the kind of big time entrepreneurs are talking about in terms of, you know, the future of social media or the future of content or the future of online communication. But at the same time, always take that step back and have a look at what is really going to work for you and what is going to make you feel really great and what is going to help your community feel really amazing. And I think that is the most important thing when it comes to creating any type of content for your business. You just gave me an aha moment because, (laughs) and I just stole that from John Lee Dumas. (laughs) Referring to his site for his Jemmy video just brought the aha moment right, right to me. Anyway, I wasn't even thinking about the fact that my podcast really is serving as blog content and I've been working on the blog or on the podcast for about a month now and all the transcriptions are going on my blog and it really, it's benefiting SEO just as much as writing an article and I'm so much more enthusiastic about this right now than any blog article I could write and Quite honestly, any blog article I would write right now is probably going into one of my solo episodes. And that's where my enthusiasm is. And video for me, no. I would honestly rather get on stage and talk to an audience than I would get in front of the camera and talk to an audience that I can't see. Because I feed off of people, you know? Yeah. So that is why I've been so hesitant to be out there and on Periscope or Facebook Live. I just wasn't feeling comfortable there. So I really appreciate that you're saying that you have to know where your strengths are. You have to know where your comfort level is. You should always try to get a little bit out of your comfort level because then you can stretch yourself, but find your comfort in one of those areas first and then figure out how to stretch it. Let me tell you listeners, starting this podcast was definitely outside of my comfort zone. (laughs) I just, I remember like four years ago, not even being comfortable enough to get on a Skype call with anybody. So the fact that I'm doing this now, I mean, and absolutely loving it. There you go. Stretch yourself. What have you seen as being one of your, scratch that, you and I both have our own Facebook groups. Do you think that that's an important key for a heart-centered entrepreneur is to have a group and a page? Again, from, you know, kind of like what we were just talking about, it completely depends on you and it depends on how you like to show up for your community and, you know, what kind of energy you can bring to it. I have 
you know, kind of biz buddies who kind of quake at the knees at the idea of having their own Facebook group because for them it's like there's so much work involved. I can't, you know, show up every day like that. There's gonna, It's just going to drain me. There's going to be so much energy involved. Whereas for me, I get really excited by the idea of having a place where I can show up every day, where I can help to encourage and to kind of nurture those entrepreneurs who really want to improve their content. And so, again, I think it's really important, like step back and have a look at, is it going to fit with your personality, with how you like to show up with what else you have going on in your business and how many social media networks you're already on and how much time you can actually commit to it. Because especially with Facebook groups, I think that is a, and running your own in that sense is you need to be able to put in the time and especially earlier on. So my Facebook group is only a couple of months old and you know, the amount of time that you need to put in at that stage is quite a lot because you're the one who's initiating conversation. You're the one who is, you know, moving things along and encouraging people to, to share their, in my case, their content or things that they're struggling with in terms of their content. So again, it's, yeah, take that step back and look at, okay, does it fit with what you're doing? Does it fit with your personality? Does it fit with, even just how much time you have available. And the other thing as well is you don't necessarily have to have your own Facebook group. You can find a group that is run by somebody else that gives you that sense of community and that gives you that sense of, you know, kind of sharing this journey with like-minded individuals. And there are a lot of kind of more heart-centered um types of Facebook groups now. And, you know, they still give you the opportunity to, you know, kind of promote your services, but at the same time, it's more focused on building that community and that supportive space to kind of just help you through the like day-to-day stuff that comes up with being an entrepreneur. So, you know, again, like just step back and have a look at what's really going to work for you and what fits for your situation. That's such a valid point about how much time you have too, because even my group has seen very little of me since this podcast got launched, just because of everything I've been doing. So shout out to the group members. Apologize. I haven't been in there as much as I want to, but I will be back. (laughs) (laughs) What are you working on right now that especially excites you? Uh, Sorry. Right now, I'm really kind of focused on helping my determined, heart-centered and creative entrepreneurs to really rock out the rest of 2016 and set themselves up for an epic 2017. Because I know there's kind of a fairly big camp of people who are shocked that we're in November and are kind of worried that they set all these goals at the start of the year whether that was to, you know, that this was going to be the year that they were going to blog every single week, or this was going to be the year that they were going to email their list consistently. But now it's been a couple of months and they're kind of afraid that their list has forgotten who they are. (laughs) Or, you know, they were going to get really strategic about social media and they were just going to pick a couple of platforms. But then Facebook Live came out and Snapchat got even bigger. So they got distracted and started running around trying to do everything all at once. And so I've created a new kind of pop-up service called the Content Overhaul, which is really designed for entrepreneurs who are feeling like I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve this year and who need someone to kind of help give them strategic direction and to help them step back and have that bird's eye view of what's going on really for their content strategy, having a look at, okay, what's working, what's not, what can you tweak, what can you change so that you can rock the end of 2016. And that means, you know, we've still got 
you know, a little under two months left. And that is still plenty of time to, you know, help you push closer towards maybe an income goal that you had or some kind of content creation goal that you had. And so the service is really designed to, to help you take that step back and come up with a really clear and specific action plan to help you work towards those goals that you set at the start of the year. Also to, to help you kind of set yourself up for a really good 2017. And that's kind of from a mindset perspective as well. And kind of coming up with a plan now and working towards achieving those goals, that is really going to help you kind of reframe your mindset, reframe how you're thinking right now about your content. And that is going to make, you know, next year so much easier in and of itself. So yeah, I'm really excited about this new pop-up service. I'm only offering it for November and December. So for the rest of 2016, yeah. So if that is something that you are really struggling with, I would absolutely love to help you with it. We'll have links to that in the show notes. So listeners, if you'd like to find out more information, please visit thekimsutton.com forward slash PP084. Rogan, I want to circle back around to the beginning of our conversation really quickly, where you talked about B-School. If you could do it all again, and I'm only asking this because I don't know that any of the other guests so far went through B-School. It was never something that came up. Would you have any doubt about signing up for it again? And would you recommend it to other entrepreneurs who are just starting out? I never once regretted that decision. For me, it was the kind of turning point that showed me that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and that showed me another path and that showed me that I didn't have to stay in a nine to five and that the skills that I was building I could use to create my own business and to help people who I really wanted to help and that really excited me to help and so if that's kind of a space that you're in B-School is amazing and I think too it's also incredible I mean the community is massive the B-School community is huge and there is, you know, the the range of people that is in that community never like ceases to amaze me. So definitely if you just starting out, whether you know what you want to do or not, it doesn't really matter. B-School can definitely help you. And also too, if you maybe have already started your own business and you just kind of need a bit more of a, a refresh or you need a bit more, a bit more direction or you need a community of of like-minded people who can help support you and cheer you on and you want to learn from you know Marie Folio who has been in business for for what seems like forever in terms of you know internet years and who you know has has weathered kind of a lot of different stages of of business herself and you know she's someone who you look up to as a mentor then yeah B school is definitely a really, really good investment. And yeah, I wouldn't change investing in that program for the world. There will also be a link to B-School in the show notes. However, it is not rolling enrollment. She opens it up once a year. Off the top of my head, and I can't remember what month it's in. Brogan, do you happen to know that? Yeah, so I'm pretty sure it starts in March, but I am pretty sure that she started advertising it already. So the kind of lead up to B school is a pretty awesome and intense launch. So even if you're just interested in launch strategy, definitely head over to yeah the B school link that's in the show notes. And even if you're not interested in signing up for B school, just from like a launch strategy perspective, it's really valuable to have a look at, you know, kind of what's possible for you know, an, an amazing, an amazing launch and, and kind of what you can take away from that, even if it's just one kind of small element of it that you can incorporate into, into your business. So yeah, there's tons, there's tons to learn from it either way. So you went through B school, you hired a business coach. What other tools, not that those two are tools, but I think you get my point. What tools were really or are really instrumental in helping you run your business day to day? So the other kind of big 
element that I would include. So yeah, B-School, business coach. The third one is not really a tool, um, but it is, it's biz buddies. Find people who you can, you know, really be open and honest with. Find people who you can share this journey with. Find people who, you know, you can encourage and can who, you know, and who in turn can encourage and support you. That in and of itself has been instrumental for me in, you know, overcoming a lot of the mindset stuff that comes up and also to like just having someone to talk to about, you know, the the little kind of business things that maybe people in your off the internet life don't necessarily either understand or can really relate to. Finding people who yeah, can just really support you has been huge. And I honestly just found, you know, two that I can think of in particular, I met through um, Facebook groups and, you know, just putting myself out there and commenting on other people's posts and, you know, asking people just to jump on Skype for like a virtual coffee chat. And that's something that I think is really important to do. And this is like, you know, no sales pitch conversation. This is just getting back to, you know, kind of the basics of building good relationships and just talking with other entrepreneurs. And that in and of itself is incredibly valuable and you don't know where that relationship could lead to. You know, you might have someone who is always going to be in your corner or as I've seen with, you know, some other entrepreneurs, you might find someone who ends up being your business partner or who ends up being a client or a customer later on. So relationships and finding biz buddies is definitely, yeah, a really big thing that I recommend doing. Oh, I completely agree. And I want to add that some of mine are even in the same industry. I mean, you're in very much the same industry as I am. And the thing is, I don't look at anybody as competition. I am me. You are you. We're going to attract different people, even if we're both going after heart-centered people. It's just how it goes. And if somebody comes along that doesn't feel right for me, yes, I'll send them over to you because there's a like- Oh, it escaped me, but you said it earlier. Like, re- trust. When you say it for me, <laughs> <laughs> what's the expression? Like, know, and trust, right? Oh, no, no, like, and trust. No, like, yeah. and trust. There you go. There's that no, like, and trust factor that I would feel comfortable sending a referral to somebody who's in the same market as I am because I don't look at anybody as competition. They're colleagues, even if we don't work together, even if we're not on the same payroll. Exactly. Yeah. And there's no, there's no bridge burning out there or there shouldn't be. If you're concerning yourself about somebody being competition, then you need to stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and start worrying about what you're doing instead. Or maybe not worrying about what you're doing instead. And that's been a struggle I've had to go through myself or a lesson that I had to learn myself was stopping worrying about what other people were doing and focus on myself finally. Exactly. Because it's all too easy to get caught up in comparison, especially with people who are either in the same industry as you or someone who is you know, kind of further along than you. And I think, yes, working hard in your business is always incredibly important, but, you know, taking the time to always kind of step back and reflect. I always find that whenever I take that step back, whether that's, you know, going on holidays or maybe it's just having a staycation, but those are the times when I'm really able to connect back in with what it is that I'm doing. And that's when you kind of realize that, there's no need for you to compare yourself to anyone else. There's no need for you to you know, think of other people as, as competition. So if that's something that you're really struggling with, then maybe it's time to take a little bit of a step back and reconnect. Like, you know, Simon Sinek says, reconnect with your why and, you know, and go back into why you're actually doing this in the first place and why it's so important for you to help the people that you're helping. And that in and of itself will really help 
when it comes to comparing yourself to other people or kind of feeling or viewing other people as as the competition. Have you found that when you take that moment to step back that you are able to be more transparent and authentic in your posts wherever they go? Yes. So this actually just happened for me a couple of days ago. <laughs> so very recently. So I have just got just been kind of on holidays and because you know this is kind of I'm coming up for my first year in business. So this is also the year that I kind of transitioned out of my 9 to 5. So it was a pretty crazy year in terms of workload. And so the holiday that I've just been on was literally like my first holiday in like a year. And so kind of everything really hit at that point where it was like, okay, it just, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Like, is there a reason that I'm creating this particular kind of content? And like, even as a content strategist, like it's important for me to still step back and to try new things and to, to switch things up. And and one of the things that I really noticed was that for me, there were certain aspects of content creation that were no longer fun. And the reason that it wasn't fun was because I'd just been, you know, kind of pushing and just kind of making myself do stuff and not kind of checking in with, okay, does this actually really feel good? And so by taking that step back and kind of pulling myself out of my business for a little bit really helped that realization to to come clear. And I did a Facebook live in my group just yesterday about this. And it just enabled me to be much more kind of transparent and vulnerable with my community. And to say, you know, I think very often it's easy for us, well, easier for us to give grace and to be encouraging to other people but we find it really difficult to do for ourselves and it's important to to step back and to look at things almost with an outside perspective and to give yourself that grace and to give yourself that encouragement and to continually reassess why you're doing the things that you're doing whether that's for your content or whether that's for any other aspect of your business i think it's it's such an important thing to, to make sure that you do. Brogan, have you read The Charge by Brennan Burchard or The Desire Map by Daniel Laporte? The Charge by Brendan Burchard, yes. Readers, I have to but- recommend both of those and they will be in the show notes. But The Desire Map, that was the first one that really got me on that. It showed me the words that I wanted to be going for in every aspect of my life. And it's still a struggle. You have to, as Brogan said, you have to step back and take a look at it. Is this action congruent with the words that I'm going for in my life? And if they're not, just really consider, is this money worth taking or should I pass it by and wait for something that is in line? And I know that's scary. It really is. Do I turn down this opportunity and the income it's going to provide right now? Or do I hold off and wait for something better to go along? Trust me, I've been through that battle. I think we all have. (laughs) I think we all do. Yeah, at different stages or another, definitely. Well, Brogan, this has been an incredible chat. I have loved it all. Where can listeners connect with you? I know you have the Facebook group and we'll provide the, the link for the content overhaul in the show notes. But where specifically can people find you online? So... My main hub, so my website, broganmickeliff.com, you can find me there. And I'm also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And I'm at Brogan Mikuliff for all of those. Mostly, I probably hang out on Instagram the most. And then, yeah, like Kim said, there'll be a link below for my Facebook group as well, where I hang out a lot. So yeah, if you're looking for me on social media, Facebook group and Instagram is where I hang out the most. On that note, I think I'm going to have to bring you back just for an episode on Instagram. <laughs> I so love talking I Instagram. <laughs> I, that's where I struggle, but I would really love to know more. So listeners, stay tuned. There will be at least a part two with Brogan. 
on Instagram. Yay. Yeah. Twitter. I, I hang out on Twitter and Facebook, but in Instagram still's got me. So thank you so much again. And thank you listeners for being here. Hey there, this is Kim Sutton, host of the Positive Productivity Podcast. And I just want to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it and were inspired, I would love to hear your feedback. Please take a moment or two and visit the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or on my website at thekimsutton.com to leave your rating or review. I'd also like to invite you to join the Positive Productivity Book Club and to find out more about my coaching packages by visiting thekimsutton.com. Until the next episode, I hope you have a positive and productive day.